So today we're here to honor Nick Gabadon's legacy as LA's early surfer of color. Um, a few topics we'll talk about today will be Allison's book, Living the California Dream, African-American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era, and then Rassan's film, Walking on Water, A Brief History on Black Surfers, the California Coastal Commission's recent landmark environmental justice policy and how to stay informed and advocate for environmental justice policies, and then also the importance of the Bay Street Beach Historic District in Santa Monica being added to the National Register of Historic Places to recognize African-American beach culture and heritage. And like I said, this all is kicking off our Nick Gabaldon Day celebration. And today we have Dr. Allison Rose Jefferson, who is a historian and heritage conservation consultant. She writes history and does programming around it as a tool in the struggle of social justice. She reconstructs the stories of African-American experience, which have been left out or marginalized in the telling of American history. Dr. Jefferson has been on the coordination team for Nick Gabaldon Day since 2013, and she's currently working on public history projects to recognize and commemorate the historical African-American experience during the Jim Crow era in Santa Monica and Los Angeles. Her work has garnered attention from KCETLA programming, the Los Angeles Times and other media outlets. You can learn more about Dr. Jefferson's work at allisonrosejefferson.com. Welcome. Um, we also have Rasan Nichols, who is an award-winning filmmaker straight from the heart of North Philadelphia. Upon graduating the Yale College in 2008 with a Bachelor of Arts in Film Studies, he founded Nichols Makes Sense Productions with the vision to produce innovative media that seeks truth, inspires viewers, and demands change. His latest documentary, Walking on Water, A Brief History on Black Surfers, won the grand prize in the inaugural race and sport around the globe short documentary competition, which was sponsored by Arizona State University. So welcome you two, thank you for being here. Thank you. So we'll hop right into um, Dr. Jefferson's uh, book. So congrats on earning the 2020 Miriam Matthews Ethnic History Award from Los Angeles City Historical Society and being highlighted in Los Angeles Times, Journal of Blacks in Higher Education and Los Angeles Magazine for your book, Living the California Dream, African-American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era. Can you tell us more about your book and how does Nick Gabaldon fit into your research? Yes. Well. I want to say thanks to Hilda Bay for having me uh, participate in this program uh, today. And um, uh, I, uh, I've, I've had the, uh, the privilege and the honor to work with the organization, as uh, Ines said, for several years. And I'm so glad to see uh, the evolution of the group in terms of uh, the different ways in which they're approaching their mission uh, of environmental justice and their social practice to um, uh, uh, advance uh, 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 coastal access. Um, my, my new book, uh, Living the California Dream, um, is, uh, examines the local stories of African Americans who fought for equal access to California's recreational and uh, relaxation offerings uh, as they contributed to the broader U.S. freedom rights struggles during the nation's Jim Crow era from the 1900s to uh, 19, the 1960s. Leisure was not an optional add on to civil rights, but an essential uh, component of, of liberty. In the examination of how African Americans made history and their attempts to create communities and business projects to enjoy the pleasures of the climate and the beautiful landscape here in California in conjunction with their growing population here, 
I show how these stories impact our lives today. I illuminate the history of the development of uh, African-American recreation and relaxation at different spots, um, uh, in different geographical environments, social, political, and economic, with different uh, social, political, and economic uh, um, uh, particulars of time and place at California oceanfront and inland destinations that flourished uh, during the Jim Crow era. And these are places that African-Americans enjoyed. Santa Monica is one of these communities examined in a chapter of my book. And the stories I have unearthed are part of the foundation for the production of Nick Gabaldon Day and other civic uh, uh, commemorations of this heritage. The first African-Americans settled in Santa Monica in the late 19th century, joining old Californios and new Mexicans, uh, uh, Euro-Americans, Jewish people, Chinese, uh, Japanese, and immigrants of other backgrounds in building the new city. Most African-Americans migrated from Southern states. They were attracted by the climate and possibilities for new life opportunities and escape from Jim Crow discrimination laws and practices. Seduced by the sand and surf resort town offerings, the early African-American pioneers joined other migrants to the region in seeking their California and American dreams. The Ocean Park District near Pico Boulevard and what we know as the Civic Auditorium area today were the locations where many African-Americans and other people of color and immigrants lived uh, from the 1900s to the 1950s. Phillips Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, which opened in 1908, was the city's first African-American spiritual and civic facility located at 4th and Bay Streets, a block south of Pico. Santa Monica has the oldest African-American settlement and institutional space of any city in the region. Nick Gabaldon was born in California and grew up in Santa Monica. When he was a child, his family lived and he was born in 1927. When he was a child, his family lived near uh, what we know today as the Civic Center and uh, not too far from um, Phillips Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. And he, uh, as Aness mentioned, is recognized as the first documented surfer of African American and Mexican American descent in the Santa Monica Bay. When Gabaldon and his surfing mate Wayne King graduated from Santa Monica High School in 1945. They were some of the few African-American students attending the school. During Gabaldon's lifetime, the Pacific shoreline south of Pico Boulevard around Bay and Bicknell Streets in uh, uh, the Ocean Park neighborhood was a popular place where African-Americans could enjoy the coastal zone. He, uh, uh, here, here they encountered less racially motivated harassment and prejudice than they might have at many other Southland beaches. The development of attractive and accessible black beaches and resorts free from white harassment was a major political issue in the long freedom rights struggle. A handsome, athletic and well-liked young man, Gabaldon taught himself to surf at this beach using a 13-foot rescue surfboard of a white lifeguard he befriended at the beach in the 1940s. The Bay Street Beach, enjoyed by African Americans, suffered the white community's attempt attempted denigration by calling it the inkwell, a reference to the skin color of the beachgoers. But some of the very people like Gabaldon, whom that slur was intended to malign, adopted it as a badge of pride. However, in many circles, it was always referred to as the Bay Street Beach and never 
the controversial name, the Inkwell. Although this beach at this site was challenged by white residents and businessmen due to its unique location, African Americans were able to avoid uh, overtly hostile discrimination as the area evolved from the edge to the center of public activity. Racial discrimination and in particular uh, 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 restrictive real estate sales and rental practices prevented African Americans from buying property throughout the urban region, but their community's presence and agency sustained their oceanfront uh, usage in Santa Monica. All this was going on as Gabaldon was surfing and paddling in Southern California while the sport and beach culture uh, were emerging in fashion products, music, and later movies. Although he may sometimes have experienced a common bond in the water among the surfing community, prejudice was not far away on land in the US or in the ocean. Even with access to the regional beaches and the financial means to pursue a desire to surf, Californians of color would have, have needed courage and dedication to be a participant in this particular small surfing community that was associated with white Southern Californians. Gabel Dunn died in a surfing accident at the P Malibu Pier in 1951 at 24. His legacy offers an empowering story of the pursuit of freedom and of self-fulfillment. For many in contemporary times, he has become an easy figure for diverse audiences to connect with. His story links to more complex, culturally inclusive stories of our collective national and global history, beach access issues, and watershed stewardship because of surfing's romantic attraction and emotional entanglement with nature, beauty, the body, practice, and unadulterated play. He is representative of African Americans of his era that challenged racial and class structures by confronting the emergent politics of leisure and recreation access when they surfed and hung out at the oceanfront, a public space that was at the core of California's formative mid 20th century identity. Economic and political issues have been important in, Afri in the African American struggle for equality in the nation, but stories like that of Gabaldon and others who frequented the Bay Street Beach demonstrate how the struggle for leisure and public space also reshaped the long freedom rights movement. In 2008, the city of Santa Monica officially recognized the historic African-American beach gathering place, as well as Nick Gabaldon with a landmark uh, monument at Bay Street and the oceanfront. On July 9th, 2019, this beach was listed as the Bay Street Beach Historic District in the National Register of Historic Places. Soon we're gonna have new signage installed and some sort of artistic interpretation uh, at the site to recognize this new uh, distinction. Later this year, uh, near Nick Gabaldon's early home, where one of the earliest African-American neighborhoods was located near Pico and Forth until it was destroyed with the Civic Center campus expansion in the 1950s, a public commemoration project will be installed to honor the displaced community members. The Belmar History Plus Art Project will reconstruct 
the history of this area to recognize African-American residents and business owners who contributed to uh, making, who contributed to making the city uh, a vibrant and unique place during the era. Important businesses like La Bonita uh, were located there and they provided services and accommodations for African-Americans from Santa Monica and elsewhere when they came to visit the beach a few blocks away at Bay Street. The, uh, this project is part of the California Coastal Commission's broader community benefit aims and environmental justice for social equity and inclusion efforts. These recognitions I have briefly highlighted create an identified sense of place in the landscape of America, California, and Santa Monica that allows for more culturally inclusive, that allows for a more culturally inclusive collective civic identity and social history encompassing a public memory. It is important to integrate the untold stories and more problematic, controversial, and sensitive aspects of our national experience into narrative, into national narratives as they show how the past has influenced the present and where we as a nation should go in the future. With Nick Gabaldon Day, we honor the memory of the many African Americans who enjoyed the beach and struggled for their California dream during the Jim Crow era and beyond. As citizens and activists, we have to continue to find ways to recognize marginalized groups and their heritage in the city of Santa Monica and beyond through our intentional actions of inclusiveness and diversity and not talking points for the appearance of political correctness. These actions, uh, uh, these actions support environmental and social justice by recognizing that all communities, including communities of color, have a right to historical and cultural sites, along with clean air, water, and enjoyment of America's Natural, uh, natural resources. Thank you so much for inviting me to share knowledge with you all today. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was super informative. Um, so in regards to Nick Gabadon, we know that um, he is the earliest known um, surfer of color. So why, why would you say it's important to honor him? What would, what would you say he represents? Um, so as I, I was saying in my, um, presentation, he, mm -hmm. uh, he is, uh, the embodiment of, um, looking at, uh, the pursuit of freedom and self-fulfillment. And he is representative of uh, all of the struggles that African Americans had to uh, gain all of these self fulfillment experiences and access to the beach and challenging class and um, um, racial hierarchies uh, here, racial structures here in California. And this relates to what was going on around the nation. So he's symbolic of all of these struggles on a universal level as well as on a personal level. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's it's really cool that we were able to actually pinpoint him. Um, how did Nick Gabaldon Day get started? So in 2012, the Black Surfers Collective, um, the Black Surfers Collective had been for several years providing uh, surfing lessons for free to kids during the summer. And um, in 2012, a film uh, called Whitewash 
which uh, I think is listed in the resources, is a uh, was uh, made by Ted Woods, and it was about African Americans and uh, surfing and the challenges that many had had uh, uh, to to enjoy surfing uh, up to that point. And um, so I uh, thought it was a really good program, and I was involved with some of the black surfers uh, in that group and. They suggested that I come to talk to Heal the Bay about uh, screening whitewash. And then as Meredith McCarthy and I, who uh, is a, one of the uh, longtime administrators and managers there at uh, Heal the Bay, as Meredith and I were talking about the film, we were looking at ways that we might be able to um, showcase the film and also do more for Heal the Bay to have outreach to reach uh, 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 communities of color, but particularly to reach African Americans. And so I suggested to Meredith and to uh, our county supervisor um, and to the Black Surfers uh, Collective and to our county supervisor, Mark Ridley Thomas, that maybe we should do uh, this program together. And Meredith liked the idea and the Black Surfers Collective liked the idea. And so that was the inauguration event in 2013 that we all coordinated and we've continued to work on this program for the last, uh, uh, since 2013 to to um, educate people about beach access issues and to give kids from the inner, uh, from uh, uh, central Los Angeles who don't necessarily live near the beach, the opportunity to come out and have a beach day and to get an introduction to surfing. I mean, since, since it's such a romanticized vision of California, I think everybody, every Californian should at least try it once. <laughs> I need to. I'm guilty of not trying. So, but I would yeah. definitely love to learn at least paddle. Yeah, yeah. I think every California should at least try it once, uh, because it it is like one of the most fun things that you could do. Yeah, it looks it looks fun. There was a, a paddle out yesterday, which was a peaceful protest, um, and it was a great turnout, and it just made me want to go get a wetsuit. So yeah, I'll learn one day. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> um, so to go back to your presentation, so I'm from the South, I'm from North Carolina and growing up there, you know, of course we learned about Jim Crow and all the um, social injustices that were going on mm -hmm. at the time. And of course, still today, it's just interesting me being a Southern girl from North Carolina, um we didn't really touch too much on the west coast we didn't touch too much on california specifically to have racial issues because it kind of seemed as though california was like the promised land where african americans were escaping the south to go out west for a better life and more opportunities so it's just really interesting to know that they were also met with some um, discrimination and um, Jim Crow was still alive over there. Um, what would you say, could you, or could you paint a picture of what um, Nick Gabaldon may have went through during the Jim Crow era in, um, in California? Well, you know, he died at age 24. So, he was a pretty young man. And in terms of what was happening in California versus what was happening in North Carolina and the South, what people don't forget is that uh, white supremacy is a thread that's uh, in our uh, structural institutional system across the nation. Yeah. It just doesn't uh, uh, look the same every place. And California was the land of opportunity for black people in comparison to some other places around the country. For one, it didn't have Jim Crow laws written on the books. Um, it had civil rights laws that had been um, uh, uh, implemented as early as 1893. So that said that uh, now they weren't always enforced, 
but they were at least on the books. And because the numbers of African Americans were smaller here, um, there was a different way in which they fitted, they fit into the social fabric of the area. Um, but they were they weren't accepted in uh, they weren't getting the beginning of corporate America. They weren't getting those kinds of jobs. Um, they were discriminated against in terms of places that they might buy real estate. Um, uh, there were black professionals here. Uh, black teachers in Los Angeles uh, were uh, uh, working as early as uh, around uh, the 1910s. And there were several black professionals who were lawyers and doctors and uh, dentists. And there were several African-American businessmen who were making money in various kinds of ways around real estate, uh, hauling and trash and those kinds of things. But in terms of integration into um, the higher echelons of government, there were in low level government jobs, but in terms of you know being able to move up into higher echelons of government and things like that, that wasn't happening until uh, much later in the century. Um, so Gabaldon would be still in the 1950s, uh, well, the 40s and the 50s would have been facing uh, these issues. Um, he was becoming a young man after World War II, and he did serve in the Navy Reserves in, in World War II. Um, and so he was at the brink of the modern civil rights era when he was a young man. And so he was seeing the changes that were happening. The military was um, uh, gonna be integrated during that time and, and African-Americans were de demanding more opportunities uh, in terms of different employment thing, uh, opportunities. And then there was that second great migration that happened during that time period where people were leaving the South. Um, again, and more of them came here in um, the post World War in the World War II and post World War II years, and that added a lot of energy to the civil rights struggles here in California because there were more people to uh, participate in the dialogue about um, uh, dismantling white supremacy. Okay, and so would you say the Bay Street Beach, was that a concentration of where a lot of African Americans kind of congregated? So the Bay Street Beach was the the uh, more favored place to go to the beach because of the fact that it was a public beach, one, and African Americans received less racial harassment there than they might have at some other places. And in Santa Monica, they at least had a small community where they had some place to have some services provided to them, like they could go to the bathroom, they could go get something to eat. And since there was this small historic African-American community that was in Santa Monica residents, um, many of the people that would come from Los Angeles to come to the beach, they knew people in Santa Monica uh, and the Bay Cities. And so there was that, um, uh, uh, connection of the Santa Monica Beach area to the greater uh, 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 African American community in the in the region, and so people would have parties there and and just go there and hang out. Now they were able to go to other beaches too, but uh, sometimes they might be harassed, and you weren't going to see your friends because they weren't necessarily going to those beaches. Yeah, that it kind of reminds me of um, Atlantic Beach in South Carolina. That was also a beach where African-Americans felt safe to go where, um, you know, there would be other, there would be other African-Americans there so they could use the bathroom, they could find something to eat without being harassed and having to deal with segregation. So. It just blows my mind that it happened in California as well. Um, so in your presentation, you mentioned the term, the inkwell. Could you explain why it's so important to remind people about the term, the inkwell? So it was a derogatory term that white people used to 
uh, denigrate African Americans uh, who used the beach area. And yes, some African Americans did um, glob onto it and and turn the uh, interpretation around to a badge of pride, but it still was derogatory. And some people would never refer to the area uh, as the inkwell. A lot of people would just say if they were African Americans and they were saying to their friends, oh, we're gonna go to the beach in Santa Monica. Well, if you were in the know, you knew where that was. You didn't have to say it was at Bay Street. <laughs> you just, you knew, you knew where it was because you had gone there before with your friends or you had heard that that's the spot right there. Yeah, so it was kind of like a, a safe space for them. And so I imagine it was a map of California, right? Los Angeles and the beaches and someone probably just said, hey, that's the inkwell or whatever, because that's where African Americans congregated and it was referring to our complexion, right? Yes. Yeah, so. Yes. Uh, more than could, so. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, if I could interject. Allison, she had to, you know, educate me, you know, really thoroughly on it because, you know, I was easy to say something like the inkwell for branding purposes, but they also called it other things too that were a lot, you know, uh, stronger language. Yeah. Uh, so just sometimes referred to Bay Street Beach, sometimes referred to as the inkwell for safety um, for the broader community. Think of it as something as, you know, has the same type of weight as the N-word, whereas some people may like it, some people really, really do not like it, depending on your generation. So you have to have that respect. Right. Yeah, so no matter what, Af and I remember you spoke to this, Allison, um, no matter what African Americans call it and how they decide to deal with derogatory um, terms used against us, just across the board for correctness, just Bay Street Beach, right? I, I would, I prefer that now, even though I was involved in the early monument making of it when it was, uh, you know, a plaque was put up for the inkwell. I was, I was a little uncomfortable with it. I, it's not a little, I was uncomfortable with it, but I didn't want to stop uh, those who had the inspiration to put the plaque up. And I was a young historian then, and I didn't have the moxie at that point in time to protest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Use your voice, Allison. <laughs> Well, um, it, it does, sorry. Uh, but it does matter because the story sticks. Yeah, if we don't correct it early on, you know, later down the line, you know, you'll never know the true intention and origin. So it really does matter what we say. Yeah. And it's just like African Americans to take lemons and turn it into lemonade, right? Taking a derogatory term and trying to make the best out of it. Um, so yeah, thank you. That was a great point because I, I've still seen, even on flyers and everything, I've still seen the ink well. And I'm just like, oh, um, yeah, maybe not. Um, it's going to take a while for people to yeah. get used to uh, the new interpretation. And once we get the signs up, uh, yeah. and the new artwork, then it'll take another turn mm -hmm. in terms of right. how people think about the place. Yeah. Um, well, congratulations on the Bay Street Beach <laughs> Historic District being recently added to the National Register of Historic Places. So I randomly took a class in um, historical research methods and we focused on the National Register of Historic Places. And I had the daunting task of registering a historic Catholic church. And that in itself was super hard to register a building because you just have to do so much research, so much digging um, and fact checking. But you actually registered an entire district. Tell me about that. What did that recognition mean to you? Because that's a huge feat. Well, um, with that, um, since I had been doing all this research uh, on this and I've now written a book about the area, uh, or a chapter in a book about the area, I knew a lot about it. And my colleague uh, who actually 
uh, he did the uh, he he did the actual writing of the nomination. My colleague uh, uh, Michael Blum of the Sea of Clouds he he uh, took on the task of gathering all the information uh, that needed to go into the nomination, and he had already written another nomination for a district in Malibu, the Malibu Historic, uh, the Malibu Beach Historic, uh, the, histor the Malibu Historic Beach District. I, I, I'm, I may have the wrong name, but anyway, the point that I'm getting at is it was a, this, this particular district, um, in terms of technical things to do with um, historic preservation, um, since there's no building on it, it makes it harder sometimes to um, get recognition. But we had a landscape where there was activity, cultural activity. So that was what, um, uh, and that cultural activity was African American beach culture, hanging, you know, people hanging out and swimming and, and socializing there at this space. And so with that, um, we were able to. Um, uh, get all the information together and get the nomination. Um, the district runs from around where uh, Shutters is down to Bicknell Street. And the reason being that, that the district runs that wide and then um, uh, around Oceanfront Walk is that originally African-Americans were hanging out at Pico and they were also going to, and the Oceanfront, they were also trying to build a beach resort there for like, uh, 20 years uh, into the 1920s, and they weren't able to because they were foiled uh, uh, by local government through zoning restrictions and the local community due to racism and prejudice. And so, uh, so when the beach club, the Casa del Mar, uh, was allowed to be built after the African Americans didn't own the land anymore, they moved their uh, hangout spot down to what we are familiar with today between Around Bay and Bicknell Street in terms of what has been recognized in the local, um, uh, the local uh, uh, landmark uh, monument that's there. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it, the, the place doesn't even look uh, the way it looked in the 1950s because there's been beach nourishment campaigns, so the beach was much narrower. Um, a lot of people don't realize that when they go to the beach, they look and they think, oh, it's always looked like this, but no, it hasn't. <laughs> they widened that beach there. The, the water was up about where the bike path is before, uh, and there was no parking lot there. There was sand and grass, uh, in, in that area. So, yeah, so we're really happy that we were able to connect the local story of African-Americans to what was going on around the country. Uh, in terms of a national recognition of the struggle of African Americans for uh, liberty, community development, uh, uh, and 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 property uh, uh, and wealth building. Awesome! Well, thank you. Pleasure. So <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing that because I mean it's here. It's gone down in history, so it's going to be here for generations to come. Thank Michael Blum of Sea of Clouds for of his effort in, in working with me on this. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for that. And I understand the importance and the hard work that went into that because, like I said, I just did a building. <laughs> you all did a whole district. So that's amazing. And I'm sure there'll be festivals to come there, celebrations to come there. So this is just one step. And you all laid the groundwork for that. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have a question here. Someone is asking, uh, Davis is asking, is the Black Surfer Collective still active? Yeah, they're around. Okay, yes, awesome. Okay, thank you so much for that, Allison. Um, we are going to switch over to Rasan. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and also congrats on winning the Race in Sport Around the Globe short documentary competition. Could you tell us about your film, Walking on Water, a brief history on black surfers? Oh, sure. Thank you. And also thank you, uh, Heal the Bay. 
And um, I like your shirt, Allison, by the way. Yeah, love it. We love to yes. see it. Uh, the documentary is, uh, it started as a passion project, actually. It was probably five years in the making, and um, I just learned something. So when you guys, Allison, when you got the, the, the registration, uh, the national, when it made the national register, the Bay Street, in 2019 that's actually my birthday on july oh, really? 9th oh okay. i just learned that mm -hmm. and then when i moved to la uh five years ago my cousin brought me to he said oh yeah man this is black beach here man like, you got to see this monument like it, you know uh back in what 2015 i think it was and so uh i like read it and i was just amazed because i love history but you know i always knew we had more in history besides slavery and so when I learned about this history in California, it was like a whole nother, like addition to the history book that I was never exposed to, like my whole life, you know, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, why did I, why no one ever told me about this? Oh my God, like black people did so many things in America, uh, you know, beyond, you know, beyond slavery, beyond, uh, you know, Jim Crow civil rights movement. Uh, and maybe that's also because I grew up on the East Coast as well in Philadelphia, there's just not enough room in the history book in high school i don't you know i don't know but yeah, anyway like uh yeah i just became really obsessed when i saw the photos and everything and i i uh, found out that uh, allison wrote the essay i found her essay on it and i contacted her and uh, she actually started to respond to me five years ago and so um the uh, arizona state university global sports institute and uh, martha's vineyard african american film festival which also has their own like inkwell beach um, in Massachusetts, off of the coast of Massachusetts and Martha's Vineyard. Uh, they were looking for documentary treatments and I submitted my pitch and I was awarded a prize to produce the film and I ended up winning a grand prize. And uh, it just was, it was just was perfect because like I said, I've been living with the story for over five years. So I already, you know, I had the relationships in place. I had visited Nick Aladonde the last few years. And so uh, we were able to really hit the ground running and tell a really powerful narrative. The film is 12 minutes. It's on Instagram. It's on my IGTV uh, at Rasan Nichols. And it's also on the uh, Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival. They have a YouTube channel as well where the film is posted. Awesome. And there's, a link, there's going to be a link to it in the uh, resources for the knowledge drop also. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So thank you so much for that. Um, so I know you're from Philadelphia. And um, you mentioned when you came here, your friend took you to the Black Beach. I knew nothing about a Black Beach here in California until um, I met Allison. So how did you learn about the Bay Street Beach and why is the beach so important to you? Well, that just reminded me of something. That's why it's important to have real estate because there's a monument there people know that we used to be there. Unlike the you know hotels and other businesses that our people tried to establish on the beach generations ago. So you know it matters to take up space and to have real estate because that is the memory of the people. So I was fortunate enough that I came to LA in an era where that monument actually existed thanks to work for Allison and others. Um, yeah, I think it was fate, honestly. I think it was I think it was a, a destiny moment uh, because I love history. I've done documentaries on um, African-American history when I was an undergrad at Yale and uh, even things for the alumni committee on the you know, African-American Cultural Center. So it just was very much in line with my passion. Nice. And so were you were you a beach person in Philadelphia? Well, no, but the interesting thing is I didn't start going to the beach until um, I graduated, until I became like a young professional after college. And even that was something like I had to learn how to recreate, how to relax. Like, I guess part of becoming like middle class. Right. That was not something that like I never felt like I had time to relax or, you know, to just lay out on the beach. Um, and I would see my classmates. Uh, white kids that yeah you know they would you know be playing soccer or frisbee in the middle of the day all these types of things and I just felt like they had more time in their day than me I just didn't understand how these kids had time to just chill and um, maybe they did or maybe that was just my mindset where I, I felt like I haven't 
earned it yet, you know? So um, that was definitely something positive for me that I had to grow into and learn how to go on vacation. You know, we're just gonna do nothing today and sit on the beach and this is, this is okay. And so I had to grow into that. And so by the time I moved here, yeah, I was very much into beach culture and I knew the pleasures of hanging out by the beach or being in water, things like that. So I know you mentioned that um, you're really interested in history. Would you say that that's what inspired you to create this film? Yeah, I think we, I just was never satisfied with the history that I got in the textbooks, you know, in, in school. And it was never really anything I could like hang my hat on per se. Like, like I just always knew we had more in our history besides slavery. And it, I just always been adamant about that. So when I discovered this chapter of American history where black people were really, um, really walking into self-determination and it just really spoke to me because I knew there was something more. I just never knew what it was. So this is what I was looking for. And also I would say, because, um, I grew up without grandparents, like none of my grandparents are living. We don't have a lot of elders in my family. And so I think I latch on to, you know, images and stories of black people from back in the day. Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything that surprised you while you were creating this film? Um, I think, well, the story I learned on the, uh, on the shutters hotel, uh, like Allison mentioned, and the Casa del Mar, that that was that was interesting. How when the black developers were actually in position and they had the finances to develop a resort on the beach, the city, and because of a bunch of people protested, they actually changed the zoning so that you it couldn't be a hotel anymore. And then once the black people were thwarted, the city reverted the zoning to let white people build a hotel at the same place. Wait, wait what? What could you Allison, speak more you about that? Me, but, uh, Allison? Um, yeah, so that's what I was saying about the Bay Street Beach District. The reason why it goes up to um, uh, from from around where Shutters is down to Bicknell is because the African American uh, community used to hang out uh, there at that area, and at one point they um, were uh, some investors were looking. A couple of different groups of investors were looking to build um, a resort uh, amusement center right there where Shutters at Pico and Oceanfront uh, uh, is. Shutters is located at Pico and Oceanfront, and so in the in the in the in in my um, in my book, I I describe it um, the whole incident in terms of the leaders of uh, the. Um, of this investment group, it was uh, Charles uh, uh, Darden and Norman O. Houston, and they tried to build a beach resort there in 1922. And the white folks changed the zoning on them to say they could only build a house. And a hundred and 500 people showed up to the city council meeting. White people showed up to the city council meeting to say they didn't want the black people to build uh, a resort there. And um, so they changed the zoning. They said they could only build a house. And in terms of whatever the real estate deal was, they once they once the black people didn't have the property anymore and the white people uh, had it back, then they allowed the white people to develop uh, Casa del Mar and uh, in 1924. And then what became before shutters on the beach, there were several establishments and the first one was named um uh oh, well there was at the bay I'm, I'm like spacing i want to say it was oh the edgewater it was the edgewater club uh and that was built by 1930. and so that's what that's why the what we remember today as the african-american beach was pushed further south to around bay street because these white clubs came in and the beach in front of those establishments became white. So black people didn't hang out over there anymore. They just moved further south. And it's a miracle if they had been someplace else in, in the south, they might have just pushed all the African-Americans off the beach totally. But they couldn't because the beach is public uh, in terms of the uh, California coastline. Um, depending on where you're standing in terms of the mean tide line. And so 
they didn't face as much hostility, but they faced hostility. That's 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 what I was getting at. You know, it varies from different places around the country. Wow. So, Rasan, in your research, I know you talk about um, a brief history on black surfers. Did you find anything that would suggest that these black surfers had um, faced any issues with this? The, this this discrimination during this time like well, were they mm -hmm. well we don't have i don't have a lot of primary sources but due to the context of the society as allison describes in her research you have to understand that there was pressure to stay on your particular part of the beach you probably were not welcome probably was not even safe to venture you know onto other parts of the coastline especially by yourself as a you know as an African American and uh, the stories in the Galvadon, yes he you know he had friends in Malibu he gained a name for himself and respect over there but as a storyteller as a filmmaker you know I can read you know we have to infer that not everyone probably was open arms you know uh, so mm -hmm. it's just things like that through our experience I think we have to fill in fill in the color and, and understand what it was like yeah right and put ourselves in their shoes how it would be it's just crazy because when you're out there in the water i'm not a surfer but i mean who's to say what line not to cross when you're in water you know so i can't even imagine what they may have gone through um but thank you for creating this film to open our eyes to that um did you have to were there any challenges that you had to overcome to create the film did you run into uh, well, it? Yeah, well, documentary in particular, you never really know what's going to happen. You know, most of the film is kind of out of your control. So I actually, I tried to film a lot earlier in the year, but I didn't know that the surf wasn't good for like half the year. And my film was due, <laughs> I think, in like April or something, but we couldn't even get into the water till June. So I had this idea for getting all this footage and, you know, the, the surf bus people like, you know, Marion is like, no, actually, weather's not good. Sorry, it's dangerous. Like, you know, so I ended up really, honestly, I had to shoot everything in really like a day. Uh, I would say 75% of the footage that made it to the film, it was all filmed on the Galadon day. So it was just this pressure to, okay, we have to make this work, guys. We have to capture everything that we can. And by the grace of God, it worked out. Uh, I um, I had to hire like a new editor because I didn't stick to my original timeline. I had to hire a new editor. So that's always nervous working with new people, you know, in, in high pressure situations. Um, Matthew, but he uh, he worked out for me. We made an excellent team. My editor, um, I uh, hired um, a new drone operator. I had two directors of photography. So it was really the whole thing got done maybe like in five days or so, uh, you know, to make an award winning film at, at breakneck speed. And um, we really, it really came together um, through the grace of God. So I'm very, um, very proud of it. It does exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I would love to keep, you know, expanding on the story, maybe a feature along the same lines. So I'm very proud of it. That's great. That would be amazing if we could get a movie out of it, <laughs> something like this. That would be great. Um, do you have any insider tips for budding film creators? I would say I had to learn the hard way, the power of teams, and two is better than one. Listen carefully to this. A dream without a team is just a wish. Yes. I love yes. that. Yes. That's amazing. Um, and lastly, um, how does learning how to swim and surf help today's youth reclaim their heritage? Well, the movie Whitewash had a big impact on me. So once I understood the barriers that black people face in America uh, from getting into public pools uh, to beach access and even the, the, the treatment of um, enslaved um, black Americans, I, I felt it as a political duty to learn how to swim and to actually learn how to surf because there were so many barriers for our people um, beforehand. So I was really motivated by that. So honestly, I didn't learn how to swim until I moved to L.A. No. Okay. Where did you learn? Did uh, you teach it? In my backyard. I just, I have a pool in my building. I just practice. So jumping into seven feet, you know, by myself was a big deal for me. Oh, so <laughs> you just went right. 
you go. I, I didn't realize that you taught yourself to swim. Oh, in your pool, in your building. Very cool. My resistance. That's my protest. Yes. Yes. Very cool. Yes. It's almost as if just living your life is a protest of an, as an African American. Um, well, well thank for, some, for some of us, it is, depending on where we are in the country. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that film. Um, so we can see it on YouTube and we can also check it out on your IGTV, right? Yes, please. There's links shown right now, which was the last page of your presentation, right, Allison? Um, so you can find that there. Your Instagram is here and your, also your website and Allison's website is here as well. So anyone who wants to check out the full length version of the film, you can do so by checking out this slide that's on the page here. And also it's in the resources as well. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you so much, because I definitely learned a lot. So I had no idea. Um, so moving on to beach access quickly, um, it's, so it's really important to remind everyone, especially um, Hill the Bay being an environmental nonprofit. Um, I know some environmental groups, they worry that they don't want to stray away from their main mission, which is um, environmental preservation and, you know, protecting the environment. So they don't really want to hop into social issues too much. But it's important to remember that environmental justice is also social justice. We face a lot of social issues with environmental issues. Um, it's called social environmentalism. You know, you have environmental racism. You have, when you think about all the environmental destruction that's going on, think about what neighborhoods they're going um, to happen in and who's being marginalized when this happens, right? So um, the California Coastal Commission adopted a landmark environmental justice policy in 2019, and this links the two together just beautifully, right? So Allison, this is a question for you. Um, how are you involved and what's included in that? So the California uh, Coastal Commission enacted their environmental justice and, uh, and social equity policy last year in March. And they invited me to speak at uh, their meeting that they held here in Los Angeles at the California African American Museum about African American history in terms of beach culture here in Southern California. And so I talked about Santa Monica and I also talked about uh, uh, Manhattan Beach and some other places and all that's in the book. You guys can pick up the book. It's there. You could read about it. And so, uh, so with that, they, I was providing them with some education about, um, uh, this, uh, 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 about these issues that, that supports why they want to do, uh, why they wanted to do the, uh, the new policy, the environmental, uh, 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 movement was a social justice movement when it was started. And it was a social justice movement uh, that related to humanity, uh, but it was really more about white humanity than it was about black humanity. And then as time has evolved, they've had to be more, the movement has had to be more concerned about thinking about different aspects of what humanity was associated with environmentalism and the different issues that, um, impact uh, uh, different groups as it relates to uh, the environment. So yeah. I don't have anything to do with the actual details of the initiation of the uh, environmental uh, justice and social equity policy of the commission, but I have uh, begun to, I worked on a project over the last year, which is one of the first things that they legislated to uh, for the Santa Monica, uh, uh, community where they told them as a part of a permit condition for uh, building a soccer field, uh, which is within uh, the coastal zone under their purview, they uh, um, put the condition on this uh, permit to build this multi-purpose 
field at 4th and Pico, where the Civic Auditorium is, that they had to recognize the African-American uh, experience that took place uh, at that site uh, when they removed a neighborhood that was called Belmar during the 1950s to build um, the Civic Auditorium and the courthouse. So I'm involved from the standpoint that I am actually uh, helping them to implement their new policies. And this particular project is a little different than what they might, what people might normally think about in terms of what the Coastal Commission is involved in. Um, they are involved in making the beach accessible for people, the coastal zone accessible for people in a variety of ways. And so the cultural heritage, the historical heritage uh, is another way to have people be able to connect to the coast, not just connect to it from the standpoint of sitting on the beach, but connect to it from the standpoint of what their what American heritage is also. Yes, yes. And also, again, to reiterate what you just said, um, and also to just, you know, just bring it all home with the environmental movement and the social justice movement. It's essentially the same thing. It's all connected, right? Um, because you can't exclude African Americans from using basically nature, right? That's the beach, nature. You can't exclude them from using nature and then also expect us to want to protect it when we wouldn't know anything about it if we weren't allowed on it. So um, it's all intersecting and it's all important. So thank you so much for being here. We really needed this conversation, especially right now. So this panel um, came at a perfect time and it wasn't even planned, obviously, but maybe it was just, you know, destiny for us to sit here and have this conversation. Um, so thank you. You all can find um, Allison at her website, allisonrosejefferson.com. Also pick up her book, which is amazing, Live in the California Dream. Um, you can find Rasan on Instagram, Rasan Nichols, and also his website, rasannichols.com. Check out the film, um, Walking on Water, that can be found on YouTube and also his IGTV. Um, did you all have anything you wanted to plug? What, any last Black words? Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. <laughs>